Hello everyone, welcome back. In this next lecture video, we're going to discuss how enzymes work, as well as how they can assist with two types of reactions that we call both endergonic and exergonic reactions. So let's begin. So how an enzyme works, all right, an enzyme, a reaction is going to require the following three things. So first off, any reaction in your body, either dehydration synthesis or hydrolysis reactions, are actually being performed by enzymes, period. So if you want a reaction to occur, you're going to need these three things. First is, you're going to need an enzyme itself, again, what we call a catalyst, something that speeds up a reaction. Second would be, you're going to need to have something that we refer to as a substrate, and what a substrate is, it's anything that an enzyme can act on. So it's, it's the reactants. So if A goes to B, A would be the reactant, B would be the product, so A is what we call the substrate at that point. So down here, again, you have this Pac-Man here, which would be the enzyme, and this blue Dorito chip that fits perfectly into that opening on the enzyme would be the substrate. And then what you also need is favorable conditions. So what do I mean by that? The two key things for an enzyme to function properly are, is you need to maintain a stable range of both pH and temperature for that enzyme to function properly. So just think about yourself and what temperatures that you like best outside. All right, I love the spring and the fall when temperatures are around the 70s. I think that is just amazing weather. Once it gets like 95 or higher and it's really humid, I just, I can't stand it. I can't be, stand being outside. So that's not the range that I prefer. All right, so enzymes are going to be the same, same exact thing that we do. They want to follow a particular temperature range and they want to make sure that the pH that they function normally in stays within a very specific range as well. So maybe that's an acidic environment like your stomach. So one enzyme that works best in a pH of 1 to 3, if you were to put that into a pH of 7, it is not going to work because it does not like that particular range. Down here in these little animations, you can kind of get an idea of how they're working. So here is a, let's say this is sucrose binding with an enzyme, and that enzyme breaks it down into glucose and fructose. So again, this over here would be an example of a hydrolysis reaction. But the enzyme could very easily do the opposite. All right, so right now, it's going to take two substrates, put them together to make a larger product, and that would have been dehydration synthesis. Or it can go the other way and break it down for hydrolysis. So again, every reaction in your body is being done by an enzyme, either dehydration synthesis or hydrolysis. All right, steps. So the overall steps to how any particular type of enzymatic reaction is going to occur. The first step is a substrate, as we just mentioned, could be one substrate or several, will bind to an area of the enzyme that we call the active site. And when the substrate or straits bind to the active site, the fusion of all of them, we produce what's called the enzyme substrate complex. All right, so if you see that over here, all right, in this little animation, there's the active site on the enzyme. That substrate's going to fit in there. When they're fused together, that is what we call the enzyme substrate complex. Now, what specifically is the active site? That is the spot where a substrate or straits are going to bind to directly on the enzyme for a reaction to proceed. So just like down here in this little picture, this opening right here on the enzyme would be the active site. You would want to have a substrate that is going to be able to fit in there just about perfectly for the reaction to be able to proceed and occur from that point in time. Now, how does the reaction work? So once you have this enzyme substrate complex, the bonds in the substrate, when I say bonds, I mean is it polar, is it nonpolar, is it ionic? they will start to interact with the bonds that are also in the enzyme here itself. And that enzyme is going to have both parts of it that are polar and nonpolar. So once the two fuse together, they start pushing and pulling at each other. As that happens, the enzyme starts to change shape. And I'm going to show you that in an animation in a moment. As it changes shape, particularly the active site, It'll cause either the formation of new bonds between substrates or it'll break bonds in the substrates to produce smaller molecules. 
So depending on how the enzyme changes shape, as well as the substrate or straights that are binding, you're doing either a, again, hydrolysis or dehydration synthesis reaction. Once the enzyme is finished changing shape and it's formed the brand new product, the product will be released and the enzyme will go back to its original shape instantly. And when it does, it'll go do the reaction again. If you remember from the last video, I said that enzymes are reusable or recyclable. So as soon as they're done a reaction, they go back to their original shape and they'll perform the same type of reaction again, over and over again. If we can see that in action, we can watch this right here real quickly. Enzymes are proteins that speed up chemical reactions in the cell. A special region on the enzyme, called the active site, has a shape that fits with specific substrate molecules. An enzyme works by binding to one or more specific molecules. So in this instance, here's our active site. And we have two substrates that are going to be able to bind perfectly into this area. It's called reactants or substrates. Binding occurs at the active site. The enzyme and substrates form an enzyme substrate complex. So there's our complex. And now the bonds that are in these two substrates are going to start to interact. What I mean by that is push and pull in the bonds in the enzyme. And the enzyme is going to start to change shape. The interactions between the substrates and the enzyme stresses or weakens some of the chemical bonds. See how it's starting to change? As the enzyme changes shape, in this instance, it's going to cause the formation of new bonds to connect these two substrates into a larger molecule. So we're looking at a dehydration synthesis reaction. In the substrates, these stresses encourage a link between the two substrates, leading to the formation of a different molecule. As a result of the chemical interactions within the active site, a new product is formed. The product is released from the active site. Now, as soon as it's released, watch this active site. It goes right back to its original shape. The enzyme assumes its original shape and is free to work again. Although this reaction has specifically illustrated the formation of a single product from two substrate molecules, other enzymes catalyze the formation of two products from a single substrate. All right, so that means is it could be the opposite. Let's say I'm going to break down this product. So the active site would have to look like the shape of that particular substrate. Binds, enzyme changes shape, and it's going to convert it into two smaller products this time. So again, that would be hydrolysis. So it's going to work either way. All right, hydrolysis or dehydration synthesis to build a larger molecule. All right, now the, the way this used to be taught was that substrates fit exactly into the active site, and that's referred to as the lock and key hypothesis. All right, now that means that the substrates, one or two, are the only ones that could fit in the active site in order to undergo a reaction. In the last decade or so, scientists have actually said, well, that's not really the way it works, that some substrates may not be able to fit perfectly or match perfectly with the active site, but they can kind of push their way in and finagle their way in, make the active site conform to their shape, and then the enzyme will undergo the reaction. That's called the induced fit model. So when I say enzymes are very specific, most times they are only doing one specific type of reaction and will only bind with one or two specific substrates. However, there are some instances where a different substrate could looks close enough to the active site where it can kind of force its way in, make the enzyme conform to it, and then the reaction occurs. And again, what we just saw in the animation, just the general idea here of an enzyme reaction. So we have the active site, going to bind specifically to a substrate that matches perfectly. In this instance, it's sucrose. We're looking at a hydrolysis reaction where the enzyme changes shape and breaks that bond into glucose and fructose. Water was used to stabilize those two. The products are released. The enzyme goes back to its original shape, and you're going to do the reaction again. All right, that's the general idea down there. Now, all right, what we have to consider is what happens now, though, if the pH or temperature go out of whack for the substrate? How is that going to hinder it? 
from being able to do its job. So that's our next slide here, if I can get to it. So again, if the environment is changed drastically, what is that going to do to the enzyme? Well, what it's going to do is a term called denature or denaturation, denaturation, however you like to say it. And that's defined by the shape of a protein, or in this instance an enzyme, changing completely. And when the shape of that enzyme changes completely, well, that means the enzyme is not going to have an active site that properly binds to the substrate anymore, and the reaction slows down and or stops. So if you draw your attention up here to this animation right now, all right, what we can see is a protein, let's say here in tertiary structure, if the temperature or pH changes, these are the hydrogen bonds starting to break. The protein or enzyme isn't kept in its original shape anymore. It unwinds, and as it unwinds, it changes the shape down here that I'm pointing to of the active site. So again, here was the regular active site. High heat or extreme pH change caused the enzyme to begin to unwind and denature, which changes its entire shape, including the active site, which cannot function or bind to the original substrates anymore. Again, looking over here, here's another diagram of it. Tertiary structure of a protein. Denaturation begins to occur either because of pH, temperature, something called ionic strength or solubility. We're focusing mainly on pH and temperature. Here it begins to unwind, so the whole shape changes. So as I mentioned earlier, each enzyme is going to function within a very narrow temperature as well as pH range. All right, it's not going to need just one specific temperature or one specific pH. But if you go out of that range too much, the rate of reaction decreases. If we look at temperature over here first, a cold temperature isn't denaturing the protein or enzyme, but it's, pro it's prohibiting the protein from moving properly. All bonds are strengthened as temperature decreases. Remember what we talked about with water? And water begins to freeze because all the hydrogen bonds are maximized and become solid. Well, that's the same thing that happens here in the enzyme where it just can't do a job. But if you start to warm it up, bonds are more easily able to move and break and reform. So the enzyme rate drastically increases. In this instance, this enzyme likes a 40 degrees C temperature the best. But as soon as you go above that, that intense heat that you're increasing is going to start to break the hydrogen bonds, causing the enzyme to completely uncurl. And that's when you have denaturation. See how it just drops drastically? With pH, you're going to have an optimum pH range, but denaturation will occur in either direction, either with extreme acid or extreme base. The only time you don't have denaturation, like I said, is when you have a cold environment occurring over here. If you take into account an egg, these poor little guys here are about to get fried or freaking out. If you crack an egg open, all you're really looking at is one giant cell that's going to turn into a chicken. The yolk, the yellow part, is really just all the cholesterol, fats, and nucleic acids. The clear part is sugar and protein, which is going to feed the developing embryo, since it doesn't have an umbilical cord, until it completely is finished being developed. So when you crack this egg on the frying pan, the heat begins to denature the proteins here in the clear portion. As they denature, they unwind. And then these big, long threads, think of it like a, as a bunch of shoelaces, as they unwind, they can very easily get tangled up with each other. And as they get tangled up, they become denser and more spread out. So the clear proteins, as they denature, begin to solidify into a solid slash semi-solid structure, which is the white that you eat. So whenever you're eating either meat or the whites of eggs, you're eating denatured proteins. If you overcook a steak and it's too rubbery or chewy, well, that steak was muscle. What you did was you denatured too many of the proteins, and again, at that point, you have made it too chewy that you're not going to want to eat it. So it's you should never eat a steak that's well done. It should always be about medium to medium well, enough to heat it to kill any of the bacteria that could make you sick. But you don't want to ruin the flavor and what little proteins that aren't denatured in the meat before you start to consume it. 